a whole list of things, of course, which the abuser tells the abused don't have to do. And that's what government is. It's an abuser. Uh, government actually is a fiction, you know. It's actually an idea. And it's an idea which cannot exist with it, without your compliance an agreement to be bossed around or hit over the head or put in prison or shot against a wall if it comes to that. So that's really what government is. And, of course, you've been trained for generations the other way around that government is something as natural as gravity, and uh, and they, they've trained you to believe that and, and that you just simply obey them, the all-powerful government. And that's why they always get people to speak with apparent authority and authoritative voices, uh, generally very rich people because we cow below, below, below uh, rich people. We're trained to cow down to, to rich folk as so there's something special about them. And uh, there is, in fact, there, there's generally psychopaths and, uh, and they've uh, fought their way to the top. They're very, very bloody people and they're not nice at all. However, as I say, government leaves a fiction and when you get a bunch of fictions all training the public into believing they're a reality, uh, then they form combines. Gangs always form combines, or called treaties actually, and they go towards a particular goal because power is an amazing thing. We don't have power or the, the, the need for power. Most folk don't. Um, they have a little power over the little room or apartment or, or house or something. Uh, inside, that's what all they have. Outside, they have no power at all, and they might not even have power over their house if the, if the tax man comes and takes it from them. But uh, we really are fairly powerless at the bottom, but most folk don't have a craving, an obsession for power. The psychopath does, and they go right towards where the big honey pot is, that's your tax money, to get into that pot and uh, become awfully wealthy from it, making a lot of deals with lobbyists. And... Um, and then they, they get into the leagues, of course. They must get into the leagues that run the world. That's how it really works. And that's what you're living through is a long-term script. It's all scripted in advance. The major events outside of real natural disasters, not the ones they can cause, which is an awful lot, by the way. But uh, uh, this, is, this is the system you're in today as they go together with their supra-governmental bodies, the G8, the G20s, and all the other clubs have formed without your permission. But that you do acquiesce to it by listening to it and, and saying nothing, uh, rather than demanding they abolish them. So that's what government really is. It's someone's idea that it gets put into a reality, and some idea that is quickly put up can just be quickly be brought down if you put your mind to it too and realize what a farce it all is. Anyway... David Cameron, um, this is the article here, his gift of war and racism to them and us. And it's by John Pilger, who is a very good uh, documentary producer and on how so many countries have been built up or exploited by uh, the West. It's not really the West. I hate using countries' terms. We're not really countries at this. It's the corporations that run the country and own the countries that have wars, invasions, and when some country doesn't uh, comply and give them all their natural resources at a very cheap price, they invade using the troops. And that's happened so many times. It's well worthwhile going into the series, many, the big long series that uh, Pilchers put over, or out over the years to show you how it all works together. Once they get their own guy in a third world country, of course, some dictator, in come all the BP guys, Exxon, GE, all the usual boys to grab the cheap work cheap labor for high, high profits. But uh, he's talking here about this present um, plunder of the Middle East, and he says the Euro-American attack on Libya has nothing to do with protecting anyone, only the terminally naive, that's a good term, that terminally naive, believe such nonsense. It's the West's response to popular uprisings. Well, they're not popular at all. He's, he's, he's conjured, but they're too. And strategic resource-rich regions of the world and the beginning of a war of attrition against the new imperial rival China. Uh, President Barack Obama's historical distinction has, is now guaranteed. He's the first uh, black president to invade Africa. His assault on Libya is run by the U.S. Africa Command, which was set up in 2007 to secure the continent's lucrative natural resources from Africa's impoverished people and the rapidly spreading commercial influence of China. Interesting, too, if you've ever read the writings of Charles Darwin, he, write, he wrote about uh, the future of the British Empire, which might merge into the American Empire or merge with it, 
and how eventually he actually talked about the different peoples they could use to run over Africans who didn't believe they had the wherewithal to run themselves. And he advocated that China would be an ideal people to rule the Africans. And that's what's been happening for a while, by the way. Anyway, back to this article. And he says here, uh, Libya, along with Angola and Nigeria, is current's principal source of oil. As American, British and French planes are currently incinerating both bad and good Libyans, the evacuation of 30,000 Chinese workers is underway, perhaps permanently. Statements by Western officials and media that a deranged and criminal Colonel Gaddafi is planning a genocide against his own people still await evidence. This is reminiscent of fraudulent claims that required humanitarian intervention in Kosovo, the final dismemberment of Yugoslavia, and the establishment of the biggest U.S. military base in Europe. And that's a whole history in itself. I, don't, people, I think people realize that the bases that America has been building up abroad uh, are there for a 100 years at least. They're actually built to, to be there for a 100 years at least. And that goes way back to the Reagan era where uh, Gene Kirkpatrick came forward and said, rather than just wait for something happening and going in and building a, a temporary base, let's build permanent ones across the world, because she was well aware, being a good communist herself, working with Reagan, strangely enough, or not so strangely, um, she knew that this would be a world uh, ongoing war to take over the entire planet, so they need bases, permanent bases across all of the, the, these countries, including Iraq and so on. The detail is also familiar. The Libyan pro-democracy rebels are reportedly commanded by Colonel Khalifa Haftar, who, according to a study by the U.S. Jamestown Foundation, set up the Libyan National Army in 1988 with strong backing from the Central Intelligence Agency. For the past 20 years, Colonel Haftar has been living not far from Langley, Virginia, home of the CIA, which also provides him with a training camp. That's awfully nice, your own training camp. That's just for gymnastics and keep fit, mind you. The Mujahideen, which produced Al-Qaeda, and the Iraqi National Congress, which scripted the Blair Bush lies about Iraq, were sponsored in the same time-honored way in Leafy Langley. Libya's other rebel leaders include Mustafa Abdul Jalil, Gaddafi's Justice Minister until February, and General Abdel Fattah Yunus who ran Gaddafi's interior ministry, both with formidable uh, reputations for savagely putting down dissent. There is a civil and tribal war in Libya, which inc- includes popular outrage against Gaddafi's human rights record. However, it's Libya's independence, not the nature of its regime, that is intolerable to the West in a region of vassals, and this hostility has barely changed in the 40 years since Gaddafi overthrew the feudal king, uh, uh, Idris, uh, won the more odious uh, of the more odious tyrants backed by the West. And it says, with the, uh, the, his Bedouin hyperbole and bizarre ways, Gaddafi has long made an ideal mad dog daily mirror, now requiring uh, heroic U.S., French, and British pilots to bomb urban areas in Tripoli, including a maternity hospital and a cardiac center. The last U.S. bombing in 1986 managed to kill his adopted daughter. What the U.S., British, and French hope to achieve is the opposite of a king's liberation or people's liberation uh, in undermining efforts Libya's genuine democrats and nationalists to free their country from both a dictator and those corrupted by foreign demands. The sound and fury from Washington, London, and Paris has succeeded in dimming the memory of January days of hope in Tunis and Cairo and distracted many who had taken heart from the task of ensuring that their guns are not stolen quietly. On 23rd of March, the U.S.-backed Egyptian military issued a decree barring all strikes and protests. This was, there was, this was barely reported in the West. With Gaddafi now the credited demon, Israel, the real canker, uh, can pre- continue its wholesale land theft and expulsions. Facebook has come under Zionist pressure to remove a page calling for a full-scale Palestinian uprising, a third into Fata on the 15th of May. None of this should surprise. History suggests nothing less than the kind of machination revealed by two senior diplomats at the United Nations who spoke to the Asia Times, demanding to know why the UN never offered a fact-finding mission to Libya. Instead of an attack, they were told that a deal had been done between the White House and Saudi Arabia. A US coalition would take out the recalcitrant Gaddafi if the Saudis put down the popular uprising in Bahrain. The latter has been accomplished 
and the bloodied king of Bahrain will be a guest at the royal wedding in London. Isn't that nice and cosy? Hmm. Well, he goes on to say the embodiment of this reaction is David Cameron, that's the, the Prime Minister of the Puppet in Britain, whose really only real job has been PR man to the television industry's asset stripper Michael Green. Cameron was in a gulf selling arms to the British invented tyrannies when the people rose up against Yemen's Abdullah Saleh on the 18th of March. Saleh's regime murdered 52 demonstrators. Cameron said nothing of value. Yemen is one of ours, as the British Foreign Office likes to say. In February, Cameron revealed himself in an attack on what he called state multiculturalism, the code for Muslims. He said, we need a lot less of the past tolerance of recent years. He was applauded by Marine Ellie Penn, leader of France's fascist National Front. It's exactly this kind of statement that has barred us from public life for 30 years, she told the Financial Times. I can only congratulate him. That's what you're living in today, folks. See, the Neros and the Caesars are all still with us. Back with more after this. Hi, folks. We're back, cutting through the matrix. Another article, too, is to do with, again, see, we're, we're run by deceit and lies. That's how they get wars going. You always demonize people and so on. You, you pick fictitious characters that may or may not even exist, but it's good enough for the public if it's repeated often enough. However, here's one from Veterans Today on Bin Laden, and it says, Years of deceit, the U.S. openly accepts Bin Laden long dead. It said, conservative commentator, former Marine Colonel Bob Pappas, has been saying for years that Bin Laden died at Tora Bora and that Senator Kerry's claim that Bin Laden escaped with Bush help was a lie. Now we know that Pappas was correct. The embarrassment of having Secretary of State Clinton talk about Bin Laden in Pakistan was horrific. He has been dead since December 13th, 2001, and now finally everyone, Obama, McChrystal, Cheney, everyone who isn't nuts is finally saying what they have known, what they have known for years. However, since we lost a couple of hundred of our top special operations forces hunting for Bin Laden after we knew he was dead, is someone going to answer for this with some jail time? Well, no, don't hold your breath. Since we spent $200 million on special ops looking for someone we knew was dead, who is going to jail for that? Since Bull Rumfeldt, Jenny continually talked about a man they knew was dead, now known to be for treasons, for reasons of political nature. Uh, who is going to jail for that, it says. Why were tapes brought out and, and now known to be forged as legitimate intelligence to sway the disputed 2004 election in the U.S.? This is a criminal act if there ever was one. Well, they're used to doing criminal acts and, and conning you. A picture's worth a thousand words and a fuzzy Ben Laden. Uh, murmuring something the CIA interpret that never jives with what it's actually saying. Um, that's what you get all the time. She's in 66 pages. General Stanley McChrystal never mentions Osama bin Laden. Everything is Mullah Omar. Now, in his talk at West Point, President Obama never mentions Osama bin Laden. Colonel Pappas makes it clear. Vice President Cheney let it out of the bag long ago. Bin Laden was killed by American troops many, many years ago. America knew Osama bin Laden died December the 13th, 2001, and after that his use was hardly one to unite America, but rather one to divide, scam, and play games. With bin Laden gone, we could have started legitimate nation-building in Afghanistan instead of eternal insurgency that we invented ourselves. And that's what I mean about CIA ops and so on. Uh, it's, you, you get into a really muddied game. It's very hard to see what's going on because there's so many layers of deception going on. But you've got to get that going to get wars going and to try to give the sheeple down below uh, some valid excuse for invading and plundering and keeping the, uh, the poppies growing for heroin and stuff like that. And remember, too, even during the, the, the hearings on Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, Bush himself was asked why he attacked Iraq. It was because... Uh, he, he, that Bush had already said that um, uh, Saddam Hussein was involved in 9-11 and Bush admitted right there, he says, no, he says, uh, Bush, he, says he was never involved in 9-11, he was just a bad man and he's better out the way. That was his answer for going to war. Of course, it was for the oil, you know that too. 
and for a long-term strategy that was laid out long before Bush was even put in, because it's long-term business planning, and that's what you live through. Now, a whole list of things, of course, which the abuser tells the abused don't have to do. And that's what government is. It's an abuser. Uh, government actually is a fiction, you know. It's actually an idea, and it's an idea which cannot exist without, without your compliance and agreement to be bossed around or hit over the head or put in prison or shot against a wall if it comes to that. So that's really what government is. And, of course, you've been trained for generations the other way around that government is something as natural as gravity and uh, uh, power over their house if the, if the tax man comes and takes it from them. But we really are fairly powerless at the bottom. But most folk don't have a craving an obsession for power, the psychopath does, and they go right towards where the big honey pot is, that's your tax money, to get into that pot and uh, become awfully wealthy from it, making a lot of deals with lobbyists. And um, and then they, they get into the leagues, of course. They must get into the leagues that run the world. That's how it really works. And that's what you're living through is a long-term script. It's all scripted in advance, the major events, outside of real natural disasters, not the ones they can cause, which is an awful lot, by the way. But uh, uh, this is this is the system you're in today as they go together with their supra-governmental bodies, the G8, the G20s, and all the other clubs have formed without your permission. But that you do acquiesce to it by listening to it and, and saying nothing, uh, rather than demanding they abolish them. So that's what government really is. It's someone's idea that it gets put into a reality, and they, they've trained you to believe that and, and that you just simply obey them, the all-powerful government. And that's why they always get people to speak with apparent authority and authoritative voices, uh, generally very rich people, because we cow below, below, below uh, rich people. We're trained to cow down to, to rich folk as so there's something special about them. And uh, there is, in fact, there, there's generally psychopaths, and, uh, and they've uh, fought their way to the top, they're very, very bloody people, and they're not nice at all. However, as I say, government leaves a fiction, and when you get a bunch of fictions all training the public into believing they're a reality, uh, then they form combines. Gangs always form combines, or called treaties, actually, and they go towards a particular goal, because power is an amazing thing. We don't have power, or the, the, the need for power. Most folk don't. Um, they have a little power over the little room or apartment or, or house or something. Uh, inside, that's what all they have. Outside, they have no power at all. And they might not even have